Um, so for those of you who joined late, that's totally fine. Um, my name is Nicole again. I'm the graduate program recruiter for the School of Film and Television here at LMU. Um, happy to answer any questions at the end of this presentation regarding questions about the application, you know, require, requirements for the application, as well as um, financial aid as well. Um, if you haven't already met Patty Meyer and Gino Brancolini, they're our graduate program directors, and they'll go into the specifics and nitty gritty of the programs too. And then we also have Brendan Friesian and Emmett Walsh, who are production students, uh, production grad students, and also Taylor Keaton, who is a grad student from the Writing for the Screen program. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen in one second. Let me, so we'll um, start off with this video, um, just kind of giving you an overview of our graduate programs here at LMU and let me know if it's playing for you. Oops, nope, it's not. School of Film and Television is one of the top rated film schools in the country for lots of reasons. We've got state-of-the-art equipment, we've got industry professionals who are teaching us, we're in the heart of Hollywood, and we just opened a beautiful new graduate film campus in the heart of Playa Vista. So the new facility here in Playa Vista is light, bright, very creative space, the kind of space that I think encourages students and faculty to be more creative. One of the things we, we endeavored to do in the designing of this space was to, as best as we could, to future protect it. Because one of the things we know about storytelling and filmmaking is it's constantly changing. The wonderful thing about the new space is it's expanded our facilities. And I'm just very excited about seeing what kind of original works our students are going to be generating. One of the things that I've been most impressed with Playa is all of the collision spaces. Writers are going to literally bump into directors and editors and animators. I'm really excited to just play in this space. The relationship we're going to be building with Silicon Beach is going to be incredibly beneficial because one, they're always looking for new voices and we are definitely looking for work and new ways to show our work. And so they're going to be able to see what we do. We're going to be able to network with them, get our stuff out there. You know, the School of Film and Television being here means that we bring our values, we bring what we believe in. And I think what we believe in, in the School of Film and Television, is that a, a well-told story can change the world. You know, I've always said it's a medium of light, and we get to choose where we shine our light. And I believe LMU helps people shine that light in the places we need most. So um, that's kind of the rundown right now of what our campus does look like. We're really fortunate today that we had a uh, town hall with the provost and he did share with us, with the faculty and staff, that we're um, reopening camp in it campus already. Um, we're going to be a vaccine center. We are hoping to bring back students in the fall and we're hoping that we will all be able to gather on that beautiful campus. And we're really fortunate because the School of Film and Television is also highly ranked in the US. We're number seven in the Hollywood Reporter as well as number eight in the RAP. Um, industry trades that have recognized kind of the excellence of our programs and also the excellence of our faculty like Patty and Gino. Uh, we also have 11 countries represented. So earlier there was a question about international students and um, the support that LMU does provide to international students right now in this uh, current uh, cohort, we have 11 countries represented with students from China, Canada, France, Russia, India, Barbados, South Korea, Kazakhstan, Qatar, Turkey, the Netherlands, and I'm sure our students who are still here today, uh, our current students who are still here can add more to that as well. So we're really excited to have that diversity because it does change the perspective of filmmaking in the classroom and that helps for everyone to grow as a filmmaker, of course, too. Um, and then we also are a tight knit community. It's a fairly small program of 219 graduate students. 
with an eight to one student teacher ratio. And that really small classroom size is important because it allows for students to workshop their ideas, whether you're in the writing programs or in the production program. That really means then that you're getting that individualized attention to be the filmmaker um, that you are coming to film school to be, right? Almost like the army, but film school. And we also have 400 companies that we've partnered with for internships. Um, we have in-house career support with Lex McNaughton, who's our career and film festival manager, with students interning at many um, industry uh, companies and studios, as well as agencies. We're very fortunate to be in the heart of the entertainment industry in LA. And so that's been a big draw for us and for why our students are um, able to be connected in the industry this way. And, you know, even though COVID has kind of put a stop on things, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Because students are filming. Henrietta, who just left, um, she was a panelist in the earlier hour, and she's shooting this weekend, actually. Emmett is going to be shooting next weekend. We still have, um, we're still able to give students who are based in the LA area um, equipment kits so that they can uh, do some socially distanced, masked up, very safe, um, COVID shooting, and we've been able to do it approximately 800 productions in the past year alone and counting. Um, and then we also have eight advanced cameras and 22 intermediate cameras. Um, but I'm going to turn it over now to Patty and Gino to talk about our alumni. And Patty, um, take it away. Oh, Patty, you're muted. Patty is still muted. Mute. There you go. There we go. All right. So one of the big draws, of course, of our programs um, are our alumni. And uh, we are really proud of having a very strong legacy from SFTV of distinguished alumni, writers, producers, directors, executives and agents among them. And here are just a few. Melissa Blake, known for writing and producing Ghost Whisperer, Criminal Minds, Sleepy Hollow, um, as well as The Wilds, the new show that did really, really well. It's coming back for another season. Brian Helgeland, screenwriter and director of Legend, writer of Mystic River, Robin Hood, LA Confidential, Effie Brown, producer of Dear White People, Real Women Have Curves, and she has a new uh, fantastic company called Game Changer. She also brings in our students for internships, which is great. Francis Lawrence, director and producer, The Hunger Games, Catching Fire, I Am Legend, and James Wong, producer, writer, and director, American Horror Story and Final Destination. And we also have Solomon Onida Jr., a producer and writer known for Joy, Witch Hunt, and Two Hand Touch. Uh, Brian Davidson, the head of Skydance Animation. Tasha Henderson, writing, writer and producer known for Dating Now, The Cutting Room, and Project Runway. Octavia Bray, who in 2018 was selected for the Disney ABC Diversity Writers Program and who's staffed on Disney Channel's Raven's Home. Octavia even worked as a showrunner, showrunner's assistant on BoJack Horseman while she was pursuing her MFA here at LMU. And we have Gloria Calderon Kellett, writer producer One Day at a Time, and Jane the Virgin. Next slide. Camille Tucker, co-writer of this past summer's Lifetime release, The Clark Sisters, the highest rated Lifetime movie since 2016, just got nominated for um, NAACP award. Evan Romanski, who I've already mentioned, wrote the prequel to the One Floor Over the Cuckoo's Nest in a graduate screenwriting workshop, ended up selling it with Ryan Murphy to Fox, Ratchet, a limited series, aired in September. It'll be back for another season. And um, he is garnering lots of nominations at this point. 
uh, Chickadilly Aguna, writer's assistant in the room for Tuca and Birdie, a hit animated adult comedy on Netflix. And Patrick Pittis, right out of grad school, Patrick's screenplay Foxhole got optioned by an independent producer. And then his next script, Rubble, was bought by Universal in a bidding war. And finally, Lucien Bourgelli, a Fulbright scholar who won the 2017 Dubai International Film Festival Jury Prize, among many other awards for his film, Heaven Without People. The film hit number one on Netflix in Lebanon just this last spring. Okay, at, uh, at this point, we want to uh, tell you some of the nuts and bolts about our, our programs, our, our three programs. And we're gonna begin with our MFA in film and television production. Uh, incidentally, the picture on this slide is um, our soundstage, our big soundstage on the main campus. And this appears to be a cinematography class where they're learning how to use um, a track dolly. Um, next slide, please. So the in the film and television production MFA program, it's a 60 unit program with five areas of specialization. You can specialize in directing fiction, directing nonfiction, creative producing, cinematography, or editing. Next. It's and re, regardless of your specialization, the initial three semesters are the same. Um, all students are taking the same prescribed courses and for the most part are assigned to class sections during those first three semesters. So let's take a look at the common core of those first three semesters. Next. The first year is probably your hardest year. Um, you know, maybe Brendan and Emmett can uh, can attest to that, but it's uh, it, it's you're making that transition from an undergraduate program into a master's program. It's 24 credits, whereas the uh, the remaining two years are only 18 credits, and it's a year of building fundamentals and exploration. So in your in your first semester, um, you're you're taking fundamental classes in directing, cinematography, post production and cinematic storytelling uh, and with the with the directing with the directing course you're exploring different kinds of films you make you make three short films one's a documentary film one's an avant-garde film and one's a, a narrative fiction film uh, but you tell the stories visually our our, pro, our production directing classes are are designed to scaffold where they build on each other uh, until you eventually get to your thesis and then in this uh, screenwriting 501 class, you are writing a storyteller, you're writing a script that you will then produce the, in your spring semester in that prod 550 class. So in that spring semester, you're taking uh, another screenwriting class and you'll be writing a, a script in there for a film you'll produce the following fall. You're taking, uh, if you're, you also have the option of specializing in documentary rather than narrative fiction. So if you if you choose to go the documentary route, you would be doing documentary pre-production for the film you will do the following fall. And then at the same time, you're taking Prod 550, which is a visual storytelling directing class. So here you're telling the story mostly visual. You, have, you can bring in a few lines of dialogue, but there are limitations and it's a four to six minute narrative fiction film. Uh, then you're taking a production planning class and a sound class, Reca 500, which is uh, basic sound for production. Next slide. And then in the, the second year, in your fall semester, you, you really have one big film you're making and you're taking a sound class that supports that film uh, and introduces you to other aspects of sound production. So the, the Prod 600 is directing actors, whereas in, in the, the previous semester, you learned to tell a, a story visually. This semester, you're learning to work with actors and you can introduce as much dialogue into the film as you want. And it's a combination of both visual storytelling and dialogue. Uh, and then you're taking the sound class to support that. And we, we kind of view this as your make or break semester because while working on that 
that Prize 600 film, you, um, as I think Emmett mentioned earlier, you decide if you really want to be a director or maybe if something else is your cup of tea. And, and so at, towards the end of this semester, we ask you to choose your specialization. And, and uh, again, those five special, specializations are directing fiction, nonfiction, creative producing, cinematography, or editing. And then from here on out, you will, you will take courses that emphasize that specialization. So in the, in the spring semester of your second year, you'll take an elective in your area of specialization. You'll take um, a writing the thesis class, which in which you will write your, your script for your thesis film. Or if you're going in a documentary uh, uh, direction, you will take a course, Prod 626, that, does, that allows you to do the pre-production for your documentary thesis. Or if you're not producing a thesis film, if you're an editing or cinematography specialization, you'll take an additional elective in editing and cinematography. Now we also um, want you to understand the canon of great films that came before you. And, uh, and, and so we have some required film studies classes. And usually this is when students start taking their their required film studies classes. We have uh, five, 513, which is a seminar in American film. Uh, and then are also film studies electives. And then at some point during your, your time here, we ask you to do um, uh, an internship. And we formalize that with a class, which is now FTVA 688. And uh, we don't find the internship for you, but we help you do the things that you need to do to secure the internship. And right now we're working with our career and professional development office to offer that internship class. Next slide, please. And then in your third year, you're, you're working on your thesis film, or if you're one of the other specializations, you're working on somebody else's thesis film. And if you're doing the, the directing, either fiction or nonfiction fiction thesis, you're taking Prize 650 and uh, in 670, which are thesis production and post-production. Uh, and, and then you're taking another film studies class in international film, plus an elective, plus two additional production electives. And if you are doing a directing, um, specialization. If you're doing fiction, you need to deliver an eight to 15 minute narrative uh, thesis fiction film. Or if you're doing documentary, you need to deliver a 15 to 20 minute documentary film. Plus for in either case, you need to deliver a festival submission plan and promotional materials for your film to, to help you uh, do something with that film when you come out. Now, if you're doing a specialization in cinematography or, or editing, then you are working on other people's films. So you're doing the thesis portfolio class or an advanced master class in your discipline um, where you are developing these portfolio materials and you are shooting somebody else's film or editing somebody else's film. You're also taking an additional international film class plus a of uh, a uh, uh, film and television studies elective. Um, and then your deliver deliverables, which are the equivalent of a thesis film if you're a director, uh, um, includes a two to five minute specialization reel demonstrating your skills, an online portfolio and website, uh, branding yourself, a personal marketing package that is further branding yourself, and then you need to demonstrate that you have worked on other people's thesis projects by including schedules, budgets, and workflows for, the, for those projects. Next slide, please. And then you, we also have the creative producing specialization. So if you're in the creative producing specialization in your third year, you are taking courses um, and you're taking the Prod 685 Producing Masterclass, the Screenwriting 685 Entertainment Business Affairs class, a, again, a seminar in Film and Television Studies, and an additional Film and Television Studies elective, 
plus you're building a thesis portfolio. And the deliverables for that specialization are that you have to work as a producer on two thesis projects and include project links in a reflection paper. You need to complete a thesis project Bible, pitching materials, marketing plan, and lookbook. And you need to deliver a digital proof of concept or written treatment and visual pitch for a web series. And you need to produce a riptone um, reel or visual sales tool for a web series. Next slide. So that's, that's pretty much the formal curriculum. And then in addition to the formal curriculum, we have a, a number of special events in, in both production and, and in screenwriting. And, and some of these events are actually um, done collaboratively. For instance, Film Rush is one that we especially like. And this, this is your, during your first week on campus, we want the, the producers to get to know the screenwriters. And so we, we, we have this exercise where in a day, you have, you have to plan, shoot, edit, and screen a short film. And we, we assign you to teams that are made up of both uh, film and television production students and screenwriting students. And then you have a day to accomplish this. And then we have a, uh, we have a screening and, a, and a, a, a social event at the end of it. Through, throughout the year, we do a number of film craft workshops, and these can, these can be anything from uh, uh, stunt coordinating to loading a truck to safely working with electrical generators. It's the, the, kind, of, it's the kind of things that are really critical to, to successfully working on set, but it's, it's not the kind of um, material that you need an entire course to learn. So, so we will offer specific workshops about you know a, a, a certain aspect of of producing and working on set um, we also have a number of mixers between the production students and the screenwriting students and again we're trying to we're trying to build relationships where um, it's a very collaborative industry we're trying to get the screenwriters to work with uh, the producers and directors uh, and then uh, Patty and I do um, uh, uh, an exercise that, that she's actually responsible for mostly where, where our directing and producing students work with the screenwriting students um, uh, for a, a, a Saturday and come up with uh, uh, some uh, pitching a project. And then we also, um, uh, for our second year students, do a, a a Saturday workshop on pitching where we bring in a, an industry specialist who's an expert in pitching and uh, who conducts a, a half day seminar on pitching. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that, that, that ends um, the, the details. I mean, I, I realized I went through that pretty quickly, but I can answer your questions once Patty talks to you about the screenwriting and we get into the question and answer session. Patty? Thanks, Gino. Uh, so as you all know, we offer two MFA screenwriting programs. The first is writing for the screen and the second writing and producing for television. Next slide. So ha here's how our writing for the screen curriculum lays out. And I just wanna say that the primary, there are several primary differences between the two programs, but the most important difference is the thesis. In writing for the screen, your thesis is a finished screenplay, and in WPTV, as we call it, is a produced project, a proof of concept um, trailer uh, short that we've mentioned before. So in writing for the screen in fall semester, uh, we're going to uh, drop you into a very intensive fundamentals course called the Elements of Screenwriting. Uh, we, many of our uh, new first years do not have a lot of screenwriting experience. So we really drill down into deep character development, the eight sequence structure, um, all the fundamentals you need um, to really launch as a screenwriter. We also require a film and television studies elective um, so that as 
uh, Gina wisely said, if you're going to be any kind of storyteller in this business, you need to know the canon. There are many to choose from. Um, and then our third required course first year is the uh, advanced motion picture analysis, where a professor will screen for you probably 10 to 11 films and break them down from the writer's point of view. And, and what we've tried to do this year is sync up a lot of the, the films that are being studied in 540, you will get to further analyze in 635. In the spring semester, you'll be taking your one required producing course for screenwriters. The, the emphasis really is more on production, though you will be creating or directing a very short short get your feet wet in production fundamentals. Um, you'll be taking uh, intermediate screenplay, which will be the screenplay uh, based on the outline you've created in 540. Uh, so you will have a foundation to embark on your first feature script. And then you have a choice of taking either writing episodic drama or comedy. And episodic means that you'll be in a writer's room breaking a season of an existing show. For instance, this year, one of our professors, well, the class chose Pen15 to break into and down into a new season. Then each writer wrote an episode. And in drama, there were some, one of the professors chose Mindhunter, another Yellowstone. And the, the beauty of this class is it teaches you how to write for an existing show, which is uh, what many, many of our writers uh, embark on career-wise when they start out is they get in a writer's room of somebody else's creation. So you really need to know how to master the dynamics of a writer's room, but also how do you write for an existing character in their voices? Um, so that is required uh, for all of our writers. Next slide. In the second year, this is a tough, tough semester. Uh, you'll be rewriting the script you wrote last spring, and then you'll be starting a brand new feature script from scratch, as well as taking our entertainment business affairs class, um, where you will learn how the factory of Hollywood works from streaming services to major studios and what are the differences in the buyers and how do you pitch to each of them? Um, how do you identify a, a marketplace for your material? It's a fantastic uh, course taught by our, um, our uh, creative producing faculty. In the spring, uh, here's your adaptation course required as I explained in our previous little meeting, uh, the bulk of uh, material coming out of all formats are adaptations of intellectual property, books, uh, true stories, uh, novels, plays. So adaptation is a very important tool in your toolkit as a screenwriter. Then uh, you'll be rewriting your second screenplay in the spring. And then finally, you get a choice, an elective, which could be sketch writing, video game writing, writing for production. Um, you can take an original drama or comedy pilot where you can create your own show. We have a, a couple new electives coming up, one on procedural writing for TV. And then as you can see here, we have writing branded content and film and TV development among others. Second, and finally, sorry, third year, keep going, sorry, uh, Nicole. Third year, fall semester. Uh, this is your, your, your launch year, as we call it. This is the career launch year. You'll be writing your final third feature screenplay, which will be your thesis. You'll be writing a drama or comedy pilot, original. And then again, you get to take an elective. Um, and finally, in your spring semester of your final year, uh, you have a dedicated portfolio workshop in which you are given the opportunity to table and workshop all the material you've written while at LMU so that it's reader ready for the industry, ready for the logline directory, we call the screenwriting directory, which goes out industry-wide 
and comprises a writer's work. Each writer gets a page with their contact information and log lines of the work that they want to go out into the business with and have read by buyers, managers, agents, et cetera. Um, and then you'll have that final opportunity to rewrite the thesis in that spring semester. So we uh, can feel confident that your work is polished and ready to be read by professionals. Um, as Gino uh, also informed you, we too have a lot of extra enrichment programs. We have a plethora of industry panelists coming in, especially now, uh, as we talked about in, in COVID times, we're getting an amazing um, wealth of industry professionals because they don't need to drive to Playa Vista. They can just pop in on Zoom. So we're we're really almost overloaded now with special events. We do a lot of pitch prep, as I said, and uh, the spring is also where you develop the your page, your very crucial selling card, your page for the screenwriting directory. So that's how the feature writing for the screen program lays out. And now I'll tell you about writing producing for television. Next slide. In the fall semester, you will have an introduction to TV production, um, as well as the elements of TV writing, which go hand in hand. Um, in addition, you have a history of TV class to give you the context and broad overview of all the TV that's led up to 2021, where TV is now. Really important and invaluable. Uh, spring semester, you'll be in the writer's room breaking a show of an existing drama or comedy, as I mentioned before, for, as uh, feature writers take as well. And here, 551 is the one and only feature film screenwriting class we require. And uh, I love to teach this class myself because a lot of TV writers grumble at the beginning of the workshop and say, why are we having to write a feature when we're in a TV program? And I explained to them, not only are you gonna learn a lot of tools that you're gonna bring back to your TV writing, but you may surprise yourself and write a feature that's gonna be the highlight of your portfolio. That may be the thing, the writing sample that gets you work or get you into a writer's room. So it's a really valuable class to have. And then finally, the 554 TV writer's room where our showrunner professors, keep in mind many of our TV professors are active showrunners working now, and they will take you through the very comprehensive and complex process of the TV writer's room experience. Next slide. In our second year, uh, there's our entertainment business affairs class. This is one of the classes where you will be taking class with uh, the other cohorts. Writing for the screen as well as the creative producing grads will also be in that class. We have four sections of it now because there, there's a lot of you and we would like to keep these classes small. And then you'll be uh, required to take both writing an original drama pilot and building out a show of your own, as well as the comedy pilot. As I mentioned in the previous session, you may not think you're funny or you may not think you're a drama writer, but you'll see, be surprised what comes out of each of these classes. And besides, as you can see now with um, what's going on with the business, many half hours have as much drama in them as, as full hours have comedy. So the genres are blurring. And um, that's also an exciting thing to take advantage of with the blurring of genres that you can experiment with. In your second year spring semester, you'll be drilling down into the nuts and bolts of production, planning, budgeting, and scheduling your thesis to come. So you'll be working on a specific project and really learning all the fundamentals of production. Uh, then you'll be rewriting the pilot, uh, either the drama or comedy that you wrote in the fall. And here are elective opportunities that come again uh, in the spring, third year. And our launch year for WPTV. The 680 producing class refers to thesis 
production. This is the pre-production class for your thesis, which you will shoot in the spring and uh, finish post on. Then you are able to take two more writing electives, which includes pilot rewrite. And as we emphasized before, the best thing you can do is get back in that workshop and rework and rewrite that pilot uh, to really make it ready and viable in the marketplace. Spring semester, uh, you'll be finishing production and doing post on your thesis project. And you'll be in a portfolio workshop with the writing for the screen cohort, uh, working on your logline directory page and polishing all the material you've written while at LMU. And you'll be uh, enjoying the same opportunities for pitch prep uh, as you get ready for the first pitch event. Um, and uh, by the way, through the course of your three years, you'll be, most of our uh, writers have at least two or three internships, which they uh, manage to interweave into their uh, course schedules week by week. And some of those internships, by the way, have been leading to actual jobs for our writers. So that's exciting to see that work out. Next slide. So uh, Gino has already gone over some of these interdepartmental events so that we can get you to collaborate and work with each other. Uh, the only one, uh, well, some of the unique events for us because we have the first pitch event or the personal pitch practice sessions with industry alum volunteers who want to come help you rehearse, um, as well as some one off uh, lectures on art of the deal where we get a writer and producer who have sold projects to come in and talk about how did that happen? How do they make that happen? And then of course, our um, first pitch event, which results after all the practice that we we give you. Next slide. This is a, a nostalgic photo for me. This is a shot of our first pitch event in Playa Vista. The good news is we'll be back in gear in person next May. Uh, however, this May, we will be doing a virtual first pitch, which we did last fall for last year's grads. The good news about this virtual pitch is we are getting an, a barrage of industry people who want to attend. Because as I said, they don't need to get in their car. They just click on a link and they get to hear pitches from a dozen LMU writers with finished materials. So that is a very popular event this year. Next slide. And industry mentor program, very important. Uh, one of the uh, aspects that make both of our writing programs unique is a post-grad industry mentor program in which we uh, have you fill out an application and determine um, or express where do you want to be in your career as you graduate and within five years. And so we match you up with a professional who aligns with your career goals. If your goal is to be a comedy showrunner, your industry mentor will be a working comedy showrunner. Um, if you want to be, um, you know, an indie filmmaker, writer, director, we're going to match you up with one of those. So that's a, an exciting um, program, which speaks to the notion that we don't like to slam the door on your way out. We're very much connected to you after you graduate. And um, I know Gino can attest that we're in constant touch with, with grads that you know left us three years ago. I hear from them regularly. So we're really on top of making sure you end up working in your chosen profession as much as we can. Final slide, I believe. Uh, this is the cover of our screenwriting directory. If you go online and type in MFA LMU screenwriting directory, this will pop up and you can see the inside of it in which, as I said, every writer gets a page to uh, list their log lines, their contact info. And this is a digital publication that goes out the day after first pitch and gets circulated among hundreds of people in the business 
this is the favorite document of managers these days. They cannot wait for this to come out because they want first dibs on our writer's material. <clears throat> and finally, take it back to Nicole. Yeah, and I'll put, um, after I stop sharing, I can also put the link to the directory. It's on the LMU website, so you can also search for it there. Um, but before we move to questions, just wanted to go over our admissions requirements. This is very general, and we can definitely talk about um, the requirements per program, because it does differ in terms of, for example, writing and producing for television and writing for the screen have different writing requirements. Production um, does not have a writing requirement on the, in the same vein. Um, the application deadline, though, for all of you is November 15th this year. Um, it's a $50 application fee. You have to submit official transcripts from all of the institutions that you attended after high school. So if you went to a community college and then transferred to a four-year college right after that, you do have to submit the transcript from the community college as well as the four-year institution because we just want to make sure that you conferred a degree. Um, personal statement, visual samples, creative samples, um, and the portfolio list. Again, those are going to differ by dependent on the program that you're applying to and so happy to go into more detail about that. And then also too, when we talk about the different requirements for these programs, um, I'm more than happy to sit down with students after um, you know our open house today to talk one on one about how you can strengthen your application. Um, and Gino and Patty also are available as well to offer any um, tips um, and suggestions as well as the students uh, to offer um, how to submit the strongest application that is representative of your work. Um, and then for our international students, if you did attend an institution outside of the United States, you will need to submit a transcript and credit evaluation so that we can just see what that transcript translates to on a 4.0 graduate uh, grade point average scale. And then um, if you also did attend an institution uh, outside of the United States where English was not the primary mode of instruction, you will need to submit either a TOEFL or an IELTS, um, an English language proficiency test, because our classes are taught in English. Um, and filmmaking is very much a hands-on process. It's not just what you're doing in the classroom, but also how you're interacting with students. We want to make sure that there's some level of English proficiency there so that you can crew on another student's film. You could be um, you know, critiquing also on in writing in the writing programs. And so um, that is a requirement for our international students. Um, so now we'll open it up to questions and I'll stop share. So feel free to just write it in the chat or shout out. Um, again, this is very casual here. We're not, um, you know, you can raise your hand as well. That's totally fine. Um, but any questions about our programs or anything that we spoke about earlier in the first hour, you're more than welcome to ask. Anything at all. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Brent. I went to Otis hey, College. Hey Brent, can we see you? I mean, I, I, I really don't like talking to, to black screens with names. <laughs> hey. Can you see me? Yes, you look Hi, great. Man. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's a bad hair day, so. Uh, uh, we don't care about that. I like mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went to Otis College. Um, I studied the digital media. Um, that was my major. So uh, I graduated with uh, motion graphics as my like study, my you know field, and um, I was just curious if that would like hinder me you know is it required that you went to film school before or can you kind of does it not matter what your field of study was before in the production program it does not matter i mean we we uh we have admitted mechanical engineers and chemical engineers as well as film students students from digital uh, media programs students from communication arts programs public relations programs English majors, psychologists, whatever. What we're what we're interested in in discovering is if you are an interesting person 
who has stories to, to tell and that you are motivated, passionate, and hardworking. Perfect. Here, here. That answered my question. Thank you. I don't know about Brenda, but I can certainly say that a, a lot of my classmates, I'm one of them, do not have a background in undergrad uh, in film school. A lot of them, like I had my undergrad degree was in philosophy, uh, mechanical, I know the mechanical engineer that Gino was talking about. I know the <laughs> uh, people. Anna. Who, yeah, yeah, Anna. Anna was a mechanical engineer. Uh, there were people who were software, you know, someone who they say they were recruited by the CIA. I call bullshit. <laughs> um, but it, it's you, I, I almost feel like the people who I've connected with the most at least in my uh, class, have been the people who don't who aren't coming right out of undergrad with a background in film. It's people who have you know had a something, had, had a job or had a career you know for coming here, and then they're applying that really lived in experience to their work and applying that POV to the films they want to make. And and they're not at a disadvantage because especially that first semester is intended to develop fundamentals. So if you're coming in with no no background by the end of that first semester, you're going to have a pretty good idea of how the industry works and Ooh. what you need to know to make a film. Even if you're, you think you're, there were a lot of people I, you know, coming in be like, yeah, I know how to handle myself on a film set. And then they're like, they're, they're, even if you have, you know, experience, there's always stuff you don't know about. There are always gaps in your knowledge. There are always places that other people can, you know, step in and fill in. Uh, and that's that's the most rewarding part of it is learning what you don't know you don't know. And I and that goes for our screenwriting programs too. The, it's so important to acknowledge what you don't know, um, and then just you know be vulnerable and uh, have the courage to tell stories that scare you that you didn't think we're safe to tell. I mean, we really want, that's how you find your voice and your vision. And what we look for in the personal statement is precisely that, are people who, who know they have stories to tell, who may not yet have the chops, this, the actual art and craft of screenwriting under their belt, but really want to learn it and feel that this medium is the best way for them to impart their stories. Um, so we, on our side, we have Jamil. Jamil was on Broadway in the Book of Mormon and went to theology school before he came to our program. Uh, so, I mean, we have poets, novelists, journalists, stand up. The working man I've ever met in my life. That guy he, does not stop. <laughs> he's amazing. Um, you know, we have stand up comics. We have, you know, uh, ex-cons and vets. I mean, we want people who have lived life and are, you know, who are compelling and can, and we, who, our favorite question to ask in workshop is, why are you telling this story? You know, and you must be able to answer that. Not only why are you telling this story, but why do we, why do we need to experience it? Um, whether it's a comedy or a drama, you know, what are you saying? about life, about your own hardship, your own human experience. And that's what every story is about anyway. So we really get you to dig deep into those questions. Um, so there's a question in the chat from Julie. She asks, are each of the programs cohort based? And yes, they are. All three of the grad programs are cohort based, but I'll allow Gino and Patty to kind of talk about why that's a benefit for our um, programs. And if you can also touch upon the size of the cohort, the general size of the cohort, because um, that was also a question from Julie. Do you know? Do you um, okay. Um, well, currently we are, let's see, for the for our, our enrollment goal for the cohort for next fall um, is going to be 54 students. Um, the cohort sticks together and progresses through the program uh, together. And as I indicated when I was going into details, the first three semesters are pretty prescribed. So you're moving along with your cohort during, um, actually during the three years you're here. 
Now, sometimes people, for various reasons, illness or whatever, will take a leave of absence and come back and join a, a different cohort, but you progress through with your cohort. Did that answer the question? Was there another part to that question? Well, I'll talk about the benefits of the cohort. Um, on the writing side, where our cohorts are small, um, actually due to popular demand, we've been asked to increase from the usual 18 to about 21 now. Um, but that still means your sections have seven in each and you're going through the program together. Um, although you, you may mix up during electives and things and you may have different professors, but you'll be taking the same curriculum generally. And what that allows is a, a real sense of uh, support and collaboration in workshop where you get to know each other really, really well. Um, at the same time, you're gonna be intersecting with the second years and the third years and developing very close relationships that way. And um, because our class size is so small, you also get to know the professors really well. We're a very collegial bunch. And uh, I think that the camaraderie we feel among each other does spill down in the kind of the morale and the, the spirit, the climate of our programs. So I think the cohorts are a real plus. And we also like to remind everyone that the, the cohort, the colleagues you work with in film school are gonna be your first industry relationships. You're all, you're all gonna be going out into the business together. Um, and there's the, a whole pay it forward system that's happening with LMU alums, which I'm delighted to see where, uh, like I mentioned, or Gino actually mentioned, one of our writers was in the Bojack Horseman writer's room at, while she was at LMU. When she got promoted, she brought in one of our grads as an intern. And when they left, they brought in another LMU Alum. So there's a, there's a lot of um, LMU relationships that start here and then go out and support each other as everyone's rising up the ranks. And that's just what the business is about. It is the old adage, it's who you know, but it's also, you know, those relationships are key because it's, this is a hard three years. I mean, really breaking the back of screenwriting and production, you're going to be working a lot. Um, and you might as well have people to lean on that are kind and supportive and that you enjoy working with. Because that's, that's what people are looking for when you come out in the business. I mean, a showrunner may interview a brilliant writer, but if they're a jerk in the room, you're not gonna get hired. And so Gino and I like to say in our orientation, you can be successful and a good person at the same time. You know, those are not mutually exclusive. And that's kind of the climate we create. I, I also want, want to mention that even though we have 50, 54 people in a cohort, we still have really small class sizes. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, you know, most of our classes are 10 or fewer people. I mean, we often teach classes with eight students in a class. I've never taught a class with more than 12 students in a class. Um, so, you know, so we have multiple sections within that cohort of every class that you're, that you're taking. Bernardo has a question. Thanks. Um, Patty, you, you were talking earlier about uh, the advantages of, uh, you know, uh, having had uh, life experience and, um, you know, uh, the opportunity to fail and, you know, be, be vulnerable and, you know, all that. And, uh, well, I have a, a question um, directly uh, associ associated to that. Um, I am actually 49, 49 years old, you know, and, and I have, uh, well, I have experience in the media, but I am, and since I was an adolescent, I, I've known I, I wanted to make films, you know, and I'm, I'm young, work for television, and I, I wrote my, 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 B, my BA thesis was about television. Um, 
my question is, would my age uh, play against me in the in the admissions process? I mean, am I? No. It's really I mean, age about... may work to your advantage. I mean, you you know, you probably have a lot of stories to tell. Uh, yeah. and, <laughs> and, and here's the way I look at it. It's never too late until you're no longer on the green side of the grass. So, <laughs> I, Bernardo, I'm 32. There's someone in my cohort who's in her 40s. Like you would be in good company. You would not be. There are some young kids. They're like you guys are a couple of kids, but they're <laughs> you, you would not be. You would not be the only gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my hair is I, it's hey. quite black. Hey, there you go. You know? yeah. Just, you're no, not, say you're 39. My mom was 39 for a decade. No one cares. <laughs> thanks, thanks. And sorry, can I can I ask another question? Um, I'm I'm planning to to apply to a, a Fulbright scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. And well, um, and I'm planning to do it in, in Mexico. I'm, I have a double nationality. Uh, and there is, well, in, they, they asked you for a writing sample, you know, mm -hmm. and so would I need to um, meet the requirements for the Fulbright scholarship as well as the requirements for the, for, for, the, for LMU? Nicole, can you answer that? They're separate, aren't they, Nicole? They're... Yeah, so they're separate. With Fulbright um, in particular, it kind of depends on what type of Fulbright you're going to be applying for, like if it's a teaching or research. But in general, because they are separate applications, um, you would have to still fill them out separately. And you're interested in the writing programs? In uh, which writing program? Writing and producing for, for TV. Yeah. OK. So. so and then what type of Fulbright are you interested in applying for? Uh, well, research. Well, it, it, it's, it's um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the MFA and the PhDs are, are uh, put together in the same application process, you know? So uh, I don't know, that's, that's what well, I mean. we, yeah. We've had Fulbrights. Every year we have Fulbright scholars mm -hmm. in our program. Um, yeah. What I think happens is first, isn't it true you first you get the Fulbright? Yeah, yeah. so first you have yeah. to do the Fulbright application and then, um, so I, I'm not sure what the timeline is for the research applications, but say for example that the Fulbright is due in June, just an example. Yeah. If you were trying to use that Fulbright though for next academic year to start in the fall of 2022, then you're going to want to make sure you get that Fulbright before you submit your application on November 15. Okay, 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 okay. thanks. And um, are there any opportunity, any teaching assistant, uh, assistantship available for you know, MFA students? Yeah. We are our, our teaching assistantships are basically part time jobs. There's a lot of opportunity for part time employment on campus and within the School of Film and Television. And those jobs usually paid, I think, currently between 15 and 18 dollars an hour. Uh, and we, we do not allow our students to work more than 20 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Brendan really Taylor busy. and Emmett yeah. are all student workers, actually. So um, they've been able to balance it with their schooling also. Desmond, Thanks. I think you had a question. Yes, I did. Um, thank you. Um, this is just opened up to um, everyone, the students and faculty, about just the general adjustment into the um, LMU curriculum and how that, and just kind of describe that a little bit in more detail and just how um, students adjust to that intensive um, course load i'm going to ask brendan to answer that because he's been sitting there quietly <laughs> yeah yeah i've been quite i don't know if i felt like <laughs> I, I couldn't answer other ones but um yeah um it's kind of unusual for me because i haven't even been on campus at all oh. but um yeah I, I came from my undergraduate degree i got at carlton college which was very rigorous and so in a way i felt prepared for that so i i don't know what you're coming from but to me, it's a very kind of reasonable, lot of, um, reasonable amount of work. You can't be working full time at the same time, obviously. But um, uh, yeah, it, it's hard work.
but but I would say it's quite reasonable. Um, and it's very, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, you're always working on uh, projects. And so if you're the kind of person who's always kind of like thinking creatively about um, what you want to be working on, then, then that's kind of perfect for, for the kind of work you'll be doing here. Um, yeah, I would say time management right. is a challenge for quite a few writers until they figure it out, that they've got to create a schedule and stick to it. Um, I can see Taylor nodding. So maybe Taylor can speak to, you know, the bumps along the way to finally figuring out how are, how are you going to plan your day so you can rewrite a feature, write a feature, and do a pilot all at the same time in the same semester. Um, Taylor, do you have any advice or reflections on those challenges? Yeah, um, I also like before coming into the program, I was a, I studied production at the University of Florida. So like um, coming into uh, LMU, I was like, hopefully this goes well. This is a different part of my brain that I'm going to be using. And so it was like, it was definitely an adjustment. But I think the to answer Desmond's first question, like um, the first semester specifically was really great because we were only outlining our first idea for a feature that we would be like working on in the um, spring. So it was like, it wasn't, I didn't feel like I was just like thrown into the fire. Like I felt like I had a chance to like understand the art of like screenwriting and then like have some more fun in the spring. And as far as balancing out like writing a new feature and then doing a rewrite and all that good stuff, um, you know, I feel like the answer is just like, you don't know how much you can do until you're doing it. Um, and I found that like, I have a planner, it's literally right here. <laughs> and, um, um, and I find that I just told myself, what do I feel like passionate about today? And that's what I work on. And so, um, and I usually try to like, I say I'm going to work on something for like 20, 25 minutes and like it ends up being more than 20, 25 minutes, but it's like just to get myself going because everyone always says it like it's like a cliche, but it's like you just have to get your butt in the seat. Like you just have to sit down and start writing because if you don't, you're just going to be thinking about it and thinking about it and you're going to have nothing done and it's going to become more confusing in your head. So yeah, I think really the balance is just sitting down and writing it. Was it Mark Twain who said that writing is uh, what 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration? Yeah, that is 100% true. <laughs> right, and we are rigorous about deadlines. We took the, take those very seriously because you're not only meeting deadlines for your professors, but for each other. You know, you read each other's work every week and you need to deliver those pages to give everyone time to prepare their notes. So that's where the collaboration, the collaborative spirit comes in. It's you can't let your colleagues down. They're waiting on your work and you, you in turn will be reading theirs. So yes, there is pressure to deliver, but you know that's what a professional creative career, career is all about. You know, you, better, you have to get used to it. Yeah, deadlines are amazing, I think. I feel like I've never been more fueled than when I'm given a deadline. Because I feel like what Patty said, like because we are receiving notes and that's such an awesome opportunity, like that's the best thing about this program is that we're getting free notes. Like we're getting notes from like nine people on a, one story, so that's amazing. And I feel like I'm driven to like get those pages out. So when I submit it, I know for sure I'm giving enough time to everyone to give me the notes that I really, really need. I also Speaking to... of deadlines, oh. um, quick question. I was just curious, uh, what is the deadline for enrolling for the fall semester? Um, I'm assuming that's when the program begins. You mean this fall? Yeah. It's passed. <laughs> Well, did you apply? Uh, for, no, I haven't. Oh, okay. So the application yeah. deadline is November 15th. Um, it's not open yet though, but it will open on June 1st. 
So if you're already, uh, well, actually all of you who are here today, you're already registered in our system. So we'll send an app, we'll send an email out to all of you when the application does open on June 1. And then we'll also send out um, follow up information after this too, if you want to set up like a one on one admissions advising appointment also. Is okay. that what you And that's for 2021? 2022. Uh, fall 2021. 2022. Oh, okay. Right. So we just finished an admission cycle. Yeah, so yeah. we'll be gotcha. opening it up for 2022 later. Okay. Thanks. It's been a while since I've been to college. So, <laughs> okay. It's been a while for me, too. <laughs> Desmond, go ahead. Um, and then, Brendan, you did have your, you were going to say something. Um, before I ask this next question, did you want to say it? I just wanted to say uh, what Taylor was talking about was just making me think uh, as well. Um, uh, during your first year, uh, for, at least for the production track, is it's high pressure in the sense that you have a lot to do, low pressure in the sense that you're expected to try things and for them to like not work out. It's you want you want to be creative. You want to see what you're good at, and so like you know if you've never tried to comedy just you know try going that direction try weird things and yeah. you will get feedback that's like okay uh, you know i see what you're going for this didn't work and that's fine that's kind of what you want because you're not expected to come in and be refined at everything that you know that's what you're here for so try things and fail um and i think that's what makes it so much fun it, to begin with if you think about it this is really your lowest stakes failure opportunity in your career. I mean, when, you know, when you're working on a, a, an $80 million film, failure is not an option, but in graduate school, you know, failure can be an option if you learn from it and, uh, and discover something. No, yeah, I can, this, you are going to film school because you want to put yourself in an environment where you can fuck up where you're encouraged to, sorry, <laughs> fail. <laughs> and, uh, but you, you learn something from that. You know, you're, you're putting yourself in that kind of, you know, comfort of, comforting environment where you take a swing, you miss, and it's like, okay, what did I learn from that? Not, okay, you will never direct a film again. <laughs> uh, that, that's, it's, that's the most really valuable, is learning how to lose well, I think, is, is a very, very valuable skill set. Thank you all so much. And then just the second part of that question, though, I know I'm talking a lot um, with the adjustment was just um, just adjusting to the entire um, just city as a whole. I'm from the South, like I'm in here at SCAD. Um, so I'm I know that would be a big culture shock. Um, how can you like just talk a little bit in how well that learning curve is to the new city and the new environment? Well, you won't be alone. Many, many st students arrive for orientation having never set foot in LA before. Um, so you will have a whole large group completely clueless about LA, um, but that's okay. You'll live near campus and you'll ride in other people's cars. You'll car carpool, you'll walk. Have a car, have a car. <laughs> well, we'll not immediately if i mean don't spend money on a car until you get situated because you may live close enough to campus i know Emmett, but the, he's going to make friends with people who have I, I, <laughs> the car. I have the car that can make friends but i you know what la is a gigantic metropolis and it's sprawls <laughs> campus is in a very specific community and you start small, you start on campus, then you hang out in Playa Vista, and then you hang out in Westchester, and then you end up interning at Sony in Culver City, which is a couple of miles that way. Or, you know, it's, you Don't will- get the beach. <laughs> yeah, the beach is that way. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really an ideal place to go to film school because it's not only a beautiful environment. I hike, so I'm like 10 minutes, I'm up in the mountains but you're also within 10 minutes from Sony, 20 minutes from Paramount. You're in the Mecca, you know, of the business. And um, those, so it's easy to get to those internships and meetings, et cetera. So. I like to phrase it as being in Hollywood's back door. Right. Backyard, back doors. <laughs> backyard, yeah. yeah backyard. <laughs>
But it's Freudian hard. slip. Freudian Back slip. Alley. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right. Also, I just wanted to say, um, like, the orientation for me, like, it's like a three day, it was a three day, or it was almost, it felt for like a week, honestly. It was such a <laughs> so a lot. But, um, you know, like a lot of that time, like we had bonded so much because we were with each other for straight up like 72 hours, basically. And um, we hung out after, like, we guess we didn't have enough of each other, but like, because we would just like end orientation and still be with those people that we just met. So I definitely don't, I definitely think you'll be fine and like navigating your space at LMU and um, also love Savannah. Um, but um, <laughs> navigating Los mm -hmm. Angeles, I think it's a big city, but I feel like there's something for everyone there and just taking your time, like to ask mm -hmm. one person, hey, you want to hang out and go like look at this place. Um, it's really easy to like find your like your element there. Yeah, I can say moving from like i said i've moved from new york to la which is a very big change um it certainly is a feeling of you know uh you know in new york you ride the subway for 45 minutes to go see a friend's band that's fine la do i want to drive for 45 minutes to see a friend's band i, I don't like them that much but uh i can say like you are so at least for me, you you spend most of your first year because you're so in it, even before, even without COVID, you're so in it kind of with your classmates on sets, doing stuff that you might not really be able to breaking out into like LA proper, but you will definitely have a social circle of, you know, your classmates and you're all just in it. You're all going through the same thing together. So you'll all, you know, you'll find your group and be like, okay, hey, what's the one night of the month that, you know, we're all free. Cool. That's like, that's the, that's the night we're going out. Like, you know, Taylor, Taylor's been there. We've all had like, okay, this is, this is it guys. Like this is the Thursday. <laughs> uh, it's really like you, you, you find your friends on set. You know, I've been on sets with people where I have no idea who they are. And by the end of it, like you and me, man, we're ride or die. <laughs> like you're, you're like war buddies, truly. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much. Our pleasure. Well, thank you all for um, joining this evening. Thanks for the questions. And, you know, if you didn't get to ask a question today or you're feeling camera shy, that's okay. You can always email sftvgradprograms at lmu.edu. Graduate program open house week still continues tomorrow. So if you do have any questions about financial aid, student life, things that we didn't get to, you still have time to ask it tomorrow. Um, and you don't need to register for any of those events, just visit lmu.edu and you'll find all of the information about it there. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email though to all of the attendees. So you'll um, get all of our contact information and then we'll also send you the packet too of just like our general like view book really. Um, and you know, Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We look forward to continuing the conversation, hoping to receiving your applications by November 15, 2021. And, uh, you know, stay safe, take care, and keep washing your hands, everyone, because we want to be able to be on campus again in the fall. Thank take you. care. Take Bye, care. Well, feel free to find, uh, I can say for me, feel free to find me on social media if you have any more questions. Happy to, happy to talk more. <laughs> Same with me. Take care. Have a good evening, everyone. Be safe, y'all. Bye, y'all. Bye.